Hello, my pleasure seekers, and welcome to today's show. I am so excited to have the beautiful um, Avangi on the show with me today. And she is a psychoanalyst in a private practice in New York, a member of the faculty of New York University's post postdoctoral program in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. And I know she has a beautiful book, which is just on her right hand side I can see um that we are gonna delve deep into today so welcome to today's show darling I'm so happy to have you thank you Lucy I'm so happy to be here oh my absolute pleasure my absolute pleasure um so there's a lot obviously there with your background um and like I always like to ask um where did you start out and how have you got to where you are now it's a big big question that no one likes to answer <laughs> <laughs> uh, big question because uh, you're careful of asking that question of a psychoanalyst. <laughs> I know, but I really want to ask. <laughs> That's such a great question. Um, I think, I mean, there's, it's hard to know where to start, but I would say I started um, um, my, the path that brought me to where I'm at when I left Greece to come to the States to study for my doctoral degree, but really to be a psychoanalyst, I have wanted to be a psychoanalyst since I was 13. Um, and usually you imagine all kinds of things about uh, your future when you're 13, and it rarely pans out the way you've imagined it. And certainly there's been twists and turns, but being a psychoanalyst is, is what I didn't, um, what I, I knew I wanted and didn't think I could, was gonna get. So, um, I think I consider myself very lucky in that respect. Why did you think you weren't going to get it? Well, because, um, you know, when you imagine things as a 13 year old, um, I mean, if you think about what one wants to be when one is 13, uh, that is kind of like fraught with a lot of fantasy and unrealistic expectation. Um, but in my case, um, I imagine psychoanalysis to be an enchanted space, which it very much is. And that's the way in which I feel very fortunate. Wow. Okay. Thank you for sharing that with me. So how did you make the journey to New York then from Greece? Um, I, I knew that I wanted to be a particular kind of analyst. And I knew that I wanted to do a doctoral degree that involved a lot of instruction. Um, I am half Greek and I'm also half Cypriot. So I grew up with a very uh, strong British influence. Cyprus used to be a British colony and there's a lot of that left over um, today too, but also when I was growing up. So there was a lot of conversation in my family about whether I was going to go to the UK or, the US and I ended up making the decision because a lot of the doctoral based degrees in the UK are very research oriented. And I felt that I still needed a lot of instruction. Um, so that's how I made the choice. Ultimately, my doctor was always going to be just a foundation for my psychoanalytic training, which is how it played out. Wow, okay, yes, yeah, smart move on going to the US and not the UK for sure. <laughs> really depends. Uh, it really depends. It certainly sets you on a, on a very particular path. Um, and being so far away from home and being so far away from traditions and ways of thinking that are not just specific to Greece and Cyprus, but also to European cultures has certainly been a challenge and something that I had to learn how to, to work with and live in. Mm, definitely. And so then for you, what is this enchanted space about being a psychoanalysis? Like I've never heard someone put those words together when they describe this field. Um, well, um, there's, you know, psychoanalysis is, is kind of a magical place. And I say magical, not in an idealizing sense, but in the sense that things happen in psychoanalytic treatments, one's own and the one one conducts as a psychoanalyst that work um, work on different in different ways than regular life works. Like one one of the way that I'd like to describe it to students sometimes is is like gravity works everywhere, mm -hmm. but gravity doesn't work the same the same way in psychoanalysis. Um, by which I mean time works differently, memory works differently. Uh, strange things happen in the relationship with one's analyst that in social life would have certain kinds of consequences, open up some spaces, close some others. 
Um, but in psychoanalysis, you can have a really strange relationship, a very Alice in Wonderland kind of relationship with your analyst where things change shapes and sizes, uh, depending on the intensity of the relationship, how much the patient and the analyst can tolerate. And it, it opens up this space that eventually develops into kind of a parallel universe. It, it's always there once the treatment is underway, it's always there. And it happens in parallel with your life, intersecting with your life. And it's both not your real life and even realer than your the rest of your life. So it's, it's a very strange um, condition um, and a very strange circumstance. And that's partly what makes it so transformational. Like if you are in a good psychoanalytic treatment, it can really change your life. Wow. I think anyone listening right now was like, right, career change, psychoanalysis, right? Now. <laughs> <laughs> or enter treatment. That's another way to do that. Oh, yeah, yes, definitely. Um, so for you then, did you find that that was quite an easy transition for you to make heading into this kind of whole new world? Or was it something that you had resistance to? Well, I'm so glad you're using the word resistance because despite how enchanting psychoanalysis is, it's also very, very difficult. Mm. And in describing it as I have, I also don't want to idealize it. Terrible things happen in a psychoanalytic treatment that goes well, <laughs> which is a paradoxical thing to say. Um, really intense things happen, things that one did not sign up for or didn't, uh, so to speak, consent to. Um, because, which is not the same thing as to say that things are happening against one's will um, or in violation of one's will. And this is actually the domain that I try to explore in the book that we're discussing today. Um, but I would say that uh, any experience, at least for me, that has been worth its salt has had to be wrested from my own resistances to it. And psychoanalysis has been no different. Wow. Okay. And so <sighs> I, where did you find the inspiration to write the book that you have created? Um, it's such a great question because I can point a number of different influences, but I would say that the tipping point was um, having, well, there's two tipping points. The one is having had the good fortune of having one of my professional talks attended by an editor of the series that I ended up writing the book for, mm -hmm. um, Joshua chambers Letson, who is a really a brilliant and daring thinker in uh, performance studies and who, had, who did not have the usual antipathy for psychoanalysis that a lot of the academy does. He was actually quite curious about it. He came to my talk and then he approached me afterwards and asked me to, discuss writing a book and putting some of the ideas that he had heard me talk about in a book. So I was, I, I would say, I like to say that I was seduced into writing a book by Josh, <laughs> um, uh, who has a wonderful manner, who was an amazing editor for me. The other tipping point was having been exposed to a work of art that um, having watched a, a play, a theatrical play that I became pretty obsessed by, and pretty preoccupied with and started writing professional work about and then decided that I needed more space in order to explore not just the, the, the work, but also the strange relationship that I was developing with it. Um, and out of that exploration came the book and some of the ideas that I talk about in the book. So what was this play? What was, yeah, what was this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is Jeremy O'Harris's uh, slave play. Okay. Um, Jeremy O'Harris is um, and an now pretty well known, but at the time not as well known, mm -hmm. uh, black, queer, young um, playwright who has written a couple of different works. His play Daddy has come to London. Slave play has not made it to London yet, but but if it does, I would urge anyone who has a love for theater um, or, or a love for thinking and being adventurously to, to watch this play, to experience this play. And it is a really, um, um, it, it's, um, it's a very specific work of art that rather than try to reassure the audience or offer 
identificatory places for the audience where you see yourself. It has this, what I would call this very beautiful and searing brutality to it in that it offers you a place for identification and then it tears it down. And it offers, so there's this constant movement of you, you have a moment where you feel like, oh, I know what's going on. I know where I stand. I know who I am. And then kind of like you're, you, you're tipped off balance. Um, and I was very fascinated, not just by the themes in this play, which maybe we'll talk about a little bit more, but also with its, with its play on the audience, the way that it acts upon the audience and the way that it acted on me. Um, and what way does it act on you? Um, I, I saw the play for the first time uh, when it was still off Broadway and um, I saw it, I knew nothing about it. I don't like to know anything about art before I watch uh, a performance or a, or a movie or a film. And I was, I, was, I was very fortunate to see it under this condition. Nobody, I had heard no spoilers. And when the play ended, it ends in a very abrupt way. Um, I, I felt completely stunned, um, completely um, overwhelmed with the experience that that I had had that was created by the playwright and by the director who is also brilliant, uh, Robert O'Hara. And, and then I was overcome by a really strange desire. All I wanted to do was to experience the play again and again and again. So the play closed and then fortunately for me <laughs> and for the people who were then able to see it, it went to Broadway. And then I started going and attending performances again and again and again. And it surprised me. It's not, I have never been infatuated with a work of art this way before. And there was a moment when I realized that I, I wasn't just going again and again and again. I couldn't not go. And then I felt that this was like at the border of my consent. Of course, I was making the decision to go. I was making the decision to spend more and more time engaging with the play, engaging with the conversations that were curated around the play by the production, where on Sundays, some members of the cast or the director or the um, other members of the production would stage conversations with audience members who wanted to participate. And I started attending those as well. And I was both elated and crushed by the demands of this preoccupation, this fixation that I developed with the play. Uh, and then I felt like I had to write about it, partly as a way of processing my relationship to it and see what comes out of it. And, and several interesting things came out of it in terms of ideas and ways to think about art, but also ways to think about trauma that I had been working on earlier, but had not solidified in a way that my uh, engagement with slave play helped me, um, helped me do. Wow, okay. And so how did you create this book based on the trauma piece then? Like this, your mind must just be so creative. I can't, I can't even imagine <laughs> um, the levels of fantasy and, you know, creativity that's in your mind is so um like honoring to be able to see this and how did you then partner the the trauma bases with the play and your obsession in your well, book yeah I, there was a moment that i decided that i had to either stop if i could or i would have to like let let this experience carry me the way kind of like a current carries you without trying to fight it, but also with the anxiety of like, where is this taking me? And I decided to do the latter. And I started taking notes while I was watching the play and making observations about myself and ended up writing this book uh, of, and, of, and the book has five chapters and two of them are on slave play. Um, it also tackles another piece of art, uh, the, the film, uh, The Night Porter. Um, and these two works of art have a lot of similarities in the ways in which they direct the viewer's gaze towards a really unexpected site, which is the entanglement of the erotic with the traumatic. And do so not to say that those are problematic entanglements, but to actually raise a series of very interesting questions about consent, about the, the return of trauma, uh, and the return to trauma 
not as pathology or a symptom, but as a way of embracing life and as a way of being in oneself, in away from the glare of how we're told we need to relate to each other and discovering new paths in oneself. And I'm always ambivalent when I talk about slave play to audiences that may have not seen it because the last thing I would want to do is spoil the experience um, of it for anybody who hasn't seen it. But one thing that I would say very concretely is that the, the works of art and also the theory that preoccupies me in this book has the characteristic of being what I have come to call traumatophilic. And traumatophilia is a, is a composite word. Um, it comes from the word trauma and the word philia, which in Greek means an affinity for or the love of something. Mm -hmm. And I use this word to interrupt um, and make an intervention in how we talk about trauma as something that disrupts us or that destroys us or that breaks us from which we have to try to work to recover or to repair. Um, and as, as a clinical psychoanalyst who works hour after hour, day after day for years now in the clinic, I, I have seen that, you know, trauma is never repaired, whatever, however we are told, whatever we're told, whatever we tell our candidates and our trainees and our students and what we tell ourselves, there is no return to the self one had before one was traumatized, no matter how good your access to resources or how determined you are to get good treatment and to work on yourself, you just never go back. So rather than the usual stance that we have both culturally and also in my field, which is to try and heal trauma, this, these works of art and the work that I do in this book is more interested in what subjects do with their trauma rather mm -hmm. than about their trauma and what kinds of inspirations, erotic, artistic, and theoretical come from this strange commingling of what is painful with what is pleasurable, of what is um, what can be grotesque and humiliating, with what can open up access to oneself and access to experience that that is not available to us through affirmation through. Um, the kinds of art and the kinds of interpersonal relations that affirm who we are and make us feel more solid in ourselves. Um, and in that case, do you then encourage your, how do I say, clients, your patients to venture into these spaces? Because there must be a lot of like, you have to create a lot of safety. Mm -hmm. um, I don't actually, and I make a, a very big point of insisting on the book that the ideas that I offer are not about, they're not a clinical technique as to what to do with patients. Rather, I try to do quite the inverse. I try to point attention to how patients and subjects in general already engage with their trauma this way. It is us clinicians and us cultural critics that are resistant to go back to a word that you used there earlier, um, that are resistant to paying attention to how, to what can, what can come out of an encounter with one's trauma that is not just problematic and not just detrimental and how even detriment in some situations might open up an intensity to life. There is that right now, the, the way in which we engage with culture, like, you know, be that Netflix or capitalism or the ways in which our attention is competed for by social media can, can dampen us to the intensity of life. And these kinds of experiences can actually open us up to them. So I am not working towards opening up patients to this experience. I'm opening, I'm, I'm trying to interest clinicians and interest mm. us as citizens of the world in not closing down these possibilities and not turning away from the intensity of life, but actually um, becoming curious about how to enter life with more intensity, with more presence, um, even in domains that may feel dangerous and risky and which may take us to places that are were entirely unexpected. And when we encounter things about ourselves that are strange and unfamiliar, um, that have to do with unconscious life, that have to do with 
histories that we did not choose, but under the uh, under the, the the shadow of which we nevertheless have to live, familial histories, cultural histories, racial histories. Mm-hmm. And have you got any kind of examples or stories that you're open to sharing to kind of give people a bit of an idea of of what this could look like maybe for them? You know, if someone's listening right now and thinking they've experienced something very traumatic and they want to step into and open up their heart as an example, what kind of have you got any yes stories you're open to share? Oh, I, have, I have a story that I'd like to to share in response to this and mm-hmm. to say that before I share it, just mm-hmm. I, one of the things that I should perhaps um, add is that these kinds of experiences are not about preparing to open your heart to something. They arrive most often as surprises or as unexpected visitations um, from uh, from parts of yourself, from parts of others that you did not negotiate. And they are, and this is a big argument in the book, they occur at the border of our consent. So let me give you an example of what I mean. Um, the um, I, I use in the book a case, um, an experience that the queer theorist Tim Dean uh, writes about in his own work. And the experience goes as follows. Tim Dean is a is a queer theorist who has been writing a lot about sexuality and writing a lot about queer sexuality and queer desire. And he describes having gone to a leather bar, uh, a gay bar with leather man where he is, um, he says he has done piss play before, always as a top. Um, And in this bar, this stranger, uh, the strange man to whom he's attracted, kind of like draws him to the back uh, of a room. And as Tim Dean is beginning to perform oral sex on him, he at some point realizes that there's something warm and liquid in his mouth. And then there's a moment of surprise where he realizes that this man is actually pissing in his mouth, (laughs) which is kind of like a, a moment of shock, right? Like they have not negotiated this, they have not discussed this. Yes, he's done this play before, but as a top, and you know, his permission has not been asked. Um, and yet he experiences he he's in that moment of great arousal where he's performing oral sex in a way that has been very pleasurable to him, but something happens that is he has not consented to, even though it is not necessarily a violation. And he says this thing, which I think is extremely beautiful and characteristic of the kinds of experiences that I'm talking about. He says that, he says, I did not consent to this experience and I would not have consented have I been asked. But that moment, that stranger gave me the gift of erotic astonishment. And he describes how he proceeds to have an an incredibly powerful orgasm unlike any he has experienced before. So here is this, I I think this is a particularly striking example, because it hits all the notes that we usually worry about when we talk about um, sex, erotic encounters, violation, consent. It's not specifically about trauma. I can give another example that also has to do with trauma. Uh, But I wanted to ease us into this by, by showing how there's this in, in an encounter with each other, there's a lot of things that are legislated for us, how we talk to each other, what we ask, what we don't ask, how we ask, even consent right now, affirmative consent, which is an important concept that feminism has fought very much for, uh, to be able to protect women from violations, from kind of like sexual harassment, for trespasses uh, at work. Like it's an important concept, but it's also now been elevated to the to the level of the law right that's how we should negotiate relationships and here is this strange encounter between these two men that again is not violation but if tim dean when he had started feeling the piss in his mouth had stopped and looked at him and said what are you doing i never said you could do that none of us would be saying look at him like what what a drama queen like you stepped into the bar, you knew what you were getting it. We would be like, most of us would say, yes, there are different protocols in gay bars and leather bars, but still like, I can understand how you were upset, right? We could totally see that. I could understand how you might even feel violated, but but that's not what happens for him. 
in this encounter with this strange thing that he did not negotiate for and did not expect, Tim, Tim Dean's spontaneous response, it's not a plan, it's not an, a, a conscious opening of one's heart, right, to go back to the phrase that you use, his spontaneous response is he meets this strangeness with an opening of his own. And what he ends up having is this remarkable sexual pleasure, experience of sexual pleasure, but also more than just a great orgasm. He has this thing that he calls this erotic astonishment. And in the book, I spent a lot of time talking about how these kinds of experiences that arrive to us at the level at the, at the border of our consent can have quite transformational potential and change not just the moment that we're in, but sometimes reorder our very relationship to ourselves, to how we understand um, our engagements with other people, our engagements with art. And in some ways, I walk the reader through my relationship with slave play to argue that my relationship with this play also happened at the border of my consent and gave me a kind of pleasure that startled and frightened me. Really? It frightened you? In what way? Well, this is where getting into the play a little bit might be helpful um, mm. to set the context because, and to move a little bit more into trauma because mm. part of what the play does is it tracks a, a series of interracial erotic encounters between partners that they do a number of different things, the primary of which is these partners are engaged in simulated sex on stage and in erotic scenes that recycle in the most explicit way all the racist tropes that we have been raised with. Um, mm -hmm. And I say we kind of like thinking both about white people, which is kind of like I, I am white, I identify as white, and people of color, like the ways in which our cultures are saturated with uh, racist stereotype and uh, race, racial prejudices. So you you see this, the, the play begins with these recyclings of these tropes played out in the erotic domain and in ways that do not seem to mostly offend anyone on stage. So it, it's a really strange experience for the audience. And then um, this is the part of the play where some people walk out who feel like, oh, I, this is just a racist sin. I didn't come here for that, I'm leaving. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when the play started um, showing in New York, there, were there was a petition to shut it down. There was a lot, of, um, a lot of intensity around the play. People loved it and hated it. Um, mm -hmm. And then what you find out in the second act is that all of these scenes are, were actually negotiated interactions between the partners. Uh, requested mostly by the people of color from their white partners. So then the question opens up of why would a person of color who has been traumatized by racism request a kind of erotic engagement that, um, that plays with humiliation, that plays with uh, racial denigration, that plays with racial violence. And the traditional answer has been to suspect either some complicity with whiteness, some internalized complicity with whiteness for people of color, or some internalized racism or some internalized self-hatred that then ends up getting played, gets and ends up getting annexed by the erotic. But that's not where the play goes. The play puts a lot of pressure on the audience to pay attention to the to the strange and familiar and weird kinds of pleasures that people of color receive from these encounters. So, you know, if you're, if, if you're a thinking and racially aware human being, it's very hard to, whatever your racial identification, like, and it's, it's harder for white people than it is for people of color because white people are more given to denying our racism and denying our complicities with, um, with racist structures, but it's very hard if you're thoughtful about these things, to be sitting in the audience and to not be horrified with what's happening, and then to begin to observe yourself and your own reactions, the play is also hysterically funny, and that creates it's, it, it creates a real scramble in your experience of it because on the one hand you see these partly terrible things happening on stage, but which are also arousing for the characters, and 
at times the script is so funny that you find yourself laughing and then you have to think about why you were laughing right. and were you laughing at or with or what is your positionality vis-a-vis -vis this laughter so it is an incredibly powerful experience um and experiences of this sort that are powerful this way are not just experiences that we enjoy they're also experiences that we suffer mm -hmm. and experiences that kind of like that torment us and which can be very painful in addition to being play, both playful and pleasurable in ways that may or not feel right and that's that's the the mess i would say in which the playwright wants the audience and that's the mess of the experience that is more traumatophilic as opposed to experiences where we enter having a sense of where the boundaries are what you want to do what you don't want to do what you want to be exposed to what you don't want to be exposed to and then if if you encounter something that you don't like you just get up and leave as many people did but if you stay then you're under a different regime you're not in the regime of recognition or in the regime of affirming what's good politics you are implicitly agreeing to go along and see what else comes with this. And that's where it become, things become risky and also very interesting in new ways. I, I hope that this is not so abstract that it doesn't make sense. Oh no, I love this. I love, I feel like I'm fully there with you right now. <laughs> no, 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 thank you, seriously, thank you. Um, and I guess then, for the ones that are staying, maybe yourself included, you're kind of questioning like, why am I exposing myself to this? And then going back to your point, why am I maybe enjoying this? Absolutely. And um, in fact, one of the brilliant parts of the, of the, at least the staging that I saw in New York is that the back of the stage was full of mirrors. So you're watching the play and watching yourself watch the play. So it's a, it's a very powerful embodied way to break the fourth wall um, and requires a kind of presence of you. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it happens in real time. Sometimes after you go back and rethink it after the play and many people, you know, I was saying earlier that some people walked out. Many people also really loved it. The play received a record number of Tony nominations, uh, 12, mm -hmm. um, but received none. <laughs> Uh, of the Tonys, which is kind of like really emblematic of like people really loved it and people really hated it. Mm -hmm. So it stirred up a lot of controversy. So much of the book is also preoccupied with experiences that that cannot be judged ahead of time as being good or bad, mm -hmm. as being ethical or non-ethical but require you to get into the mess of what it means to be entangled or what it means to be um, caught in something. Um, I mean, which is, a lot of sex is like that too. I was gonna say, and how I was literally put the words in my mouth gonna say like, and what would you, and how would you relate that to sex? So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, there are certainly experiences of sexuality that make us feel safe and valued and understood by our partners. And those are very, very, very important, very precious. Um, there's also other experiences like, for example, the one described that it was just describing uh, that Tim Dean offers that where sexuality does something else, where it's not about feeling safe, it's something that is more transformative and more um, that erupts with an intensity that is unbearable in everyday life. Like we can't live life at that level of intensity. We would, we would be both exhausted and, and broken very quickly. But, but eroticism offers, and I think some relations to art and some psychoanalytic moments, th that's where the three come together, offer these kind of like condensed experiences of intensity that make, can make us feel alive and can make us feel very present with ourselves. Um, and do you ever find that those situations can become addictive to feeling that present or to chasing that somewhat fantasy or high in some ways? That's such a great question. <laughs> um, I think that if they get turned into chasing a high, mm -hmm. 
then they are degraded versions of what I'm talking about because mm -hmm. then they become projects and they become something to plan or to go after. When, when I was speaking earlier, I was talking about how these experiences arrive unbidden and they arrive as surprises to which you either give yourself to or you don't. So I, for example, I didn't go to watch a play thinking I'm going to have a transformational experience. Right. If, you, if you start a sexual experience this way, it doesn't work either. And anybody who is involved in high voltage experiences will tell you that trying to plan for them doesn't necessarily work. Um, the, the addictive part that you're talking about is in my mind, actually a resistance to this openness to having those kinds of experiences, because then they become, they become like an object that you want to reproduce in a way control. Like, you know, if it's like, it's like going to a play, really liking the play and then wanting to buy the t-shirt that has the play's logo or the mug. And that's, that's a way of trying to possess something, represent in a material realm and trying to possess something about your experience of it. You take that mug home, maybe you use it, maybe you don't. It just doesn't do for you what you hoped it would do when you bought it, which was that it would capture something about the experience itself, right? Uh, th this is the way in which experience gets commodified. And I think that addiction is very much related to this effort to grasp something about these moments that are fleeting and they're not material they're psychic and you cannot create them at will uh, and I think that addictive states are trying are, are a resistance to to allowing oneself to be moved through experience and rather trying to take the reins of experience and control it so would you say did you then develop an addiction to the play yourself um, no, even though, um, that would not be an inaccurate term in the, in, insofar as it would describe my need to return my, um, my return, despite the fact that other things called for my attention. Uh, in fact, when I, when I finished the book and I looked back, I was surprised to realize that my, being transfixed with a play did not compromise me like I still saw my patients and I still wrote work and I still taught my classes but that's not how it felt when I was going through it it felt like nothing else matters mm -hmm. uh, so from that perspective I can understand why the word addiction might come to mind but what what addiction does which was not part of my experience is that it tries to create a certain kind of outcome like a high an intensity, the chase, you know, you hear people who do certain kinds of drugs for the first time, they keep chasing that first experience and you never get it again. Yeah. Um, for me, most of the times, if not all of the times that I went back felt like an experience. Um, and like, and, and I, I was not trying to have the same experience that I was, that I had the same time. I wanted each time to be thrown into it and see what comes. Sometimes I, I left feeling that, the play felt more dampened perhaps because of the particular audience or the particular moment that I was in or the ways something in the performance. And other times different things lit up and different things started blinking to me or waving at me in, uh, is one way to put it in the play and I paid attention to different parts of it. So um, addiction has this strange characteristic which is that it's a very it's it, there's an absence to it it's mm -hmm. like uh, almost like be being present for something that is so uh that it's both intense but also um you're trying to grab or and to be to to get a hold of and that's that was not my relationship with the play mm -hmm. okay wow and so i don't even know where to start now <laughs> Oh, with, so with your the book and the, the story that you shared obviously around that man experiencing what he did in, in Paris of someone pissing in his mouth do you find this is quite a common thing that comes up for you and pay, your patients or speaking to other clinicians where people are in certain circumstances like that maybe not that exact circumstance where they then realize 
that there is this whole new kind of life within them? Or do you think a lot of people may be fearful to actually, once they've stepped into it, to being like, oh my gosh, I need to check myself into a mental home <laughs> or I'm gonna run away and become a nun. Um, yeah, how do you find that piece? That's, um, that's a, a very key question because fear is um, quite powerful um, in that respect. And this is why you asked me earlier if I'm, if I'm encouraging my patients to have these experiences. And I said, I don't. What I'm encouraging is other clinicians to not shy away from patients who are having these experiences or who are in some way in get, trying to engage their fear around these experiences. Um, because to find yourself in domains that you don't, that you're not familiar with, and in places that you don't understand about yourself, is not. It's that's not an easy endeavor, mm -hmm. uh, and that's not always welcome. There's parts of the self that all they want to do is turn away from that. And in fact, when I kind of like when I, I opened the book by. At the end of my introduction, I address the reader and say something about the experience of what it was like to write the book. And I say that writing this book took me to places inside of me that have scared me. And sometimes I felt like I've been before something that is much bigger than me that made me feel really small in really good ways. Um, that's not the way we usually think about our relative size in relation to experience. And, and I, I say to the reader, that I've written this book for the reader to follow me there. Um, and I ask the reader to give themselves over to the action of the book and to me as the author uh, so that they may also have an experience in reading the book. And this has been one of the most gratifying comments that I've gotten from readers who write to me, not just to talk about ideas, but to talk about what it was like to read the book and the intensity of um, both the, the ideas and the way in which I have written the book to be an experience, just like it was an experience for me to write it. Mm. Wow. Okay. Well, I think, Fuzzy, thank you so much for sharing your passion you. and your journey and what you've created, which is just unimaginable, really, you know? Um, it's been an absolute honor to have you on today's show. And I think anyone listening is going to be ordering that book. So I will put the book in the show notes. Just for anyone listening, what, what is the name of your book and where can they find it as well? Oh, thank you. That's, that's an important point that I of forgot. Course. I didn't realize we haven't even covered that. <laughs> um, so the, the book is called Sexuality Beyond Consent, Risk, Race, Traumatophilia. And uh, it is published by NYU Press. Um, and if anybody reads the book, I should say, and are interested in um, are interested in speaking to me or leaving a review, like I engage with my reviewers, so please um, know that you will hear from me. And um, I'm really interested in what people make of this book and what it's like for them to read it. So reach out to me in social media. I'll be very happy to engage. Oh, I love that. Okay, thank you. My audience are very um, vocal. So <laughs> I think you'll, you'll know when you hear from them, um, which I love. Obviously, I love that about them. So um, I will put the book in the show notes for everyone listening today. And um, for anyone that wants to find you and hear more about you, where can they find you as well? Well, um, people can check out my website. There's a, a series of listings there about where I'm speaking next. Some of them are virtual if anybody wants to attend a talk. Uh, it's avyesagetopulu.com, my first and last name. Um, and uh, I am very active on Instagram, where you can follow me at avgolis98, A-V-G-O-L-I-S-9-8. Mm -hmm. Okay, amazing. Well, I'll put all of those things in the show notes as well. But um, much. once again, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And just keep creating the magic and unimaginable beyond this world the creations that you're making thank you for being you <laughs> thank you lucy oh pleasure thank you so much